This is the untold story of the making of the modern world. We follow the flow of civilization from the Middle East, an extraordinary place that is home to the founding cultures of history, a vital link between the continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe, an economic, scientific, and cultural birthplace of the world. A fresh perspective charting the spread of civilization across the globe. From the dawn of mankind and the first cities and empires to the belief in one God. It will be an epic journey of discovery where East meets West. Mount Nemrut in modern Turkey overlooks the ancient river Euphrates. From here is a spectacular view of Mesopotamia. At the dawn of mankind, this land between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris was the cradle of civilization. Ufka baktığınız zaman doğuda, batıda, kuzeyde, güneyde sanki ayaklarınızın altına serilmiş gibidir. Ufkun her boyutuna uzanabiliyorsunuz ve oradan uygarlıkların nasıl bir araya geldiğini müşahhas olarak görebiliyorsunuz. At the top of Nemrut, hidden beneath huge man-made burial mounds, is the 2,000-year-old tomb of a king, Antiochus. Antiochus was of Greek and Persian descent. In homage to this mixed ancestry, he flanked his tomb with huge statues of Greek and Persian gods. The Greek god Zeus and demigod Heracles facing west to Greece, and the Persian deities, Oromazdes and Van, facing east to Persia. Antiochus's great monument symbolizes the meeting of what we now think of as Eastern and Western culture. Its position, overlooking Mesopotamia, is a powerful reminder that civilization, as we largely know it, was born in this land between two rivers. Before the birth of civilization, humans were nomads, tribes scouring the landscape for shelter and food. They lived by foraging and hunting. But extraordinary new discoveries show that something dramatic happened around 12,000 years ago. Excavations in Turkey at Gobekli Tepe show they stopped their wandering. For the first time ever, humans began to build. All these earth mounds we see here are artificial. They are not done by nature, they are artificial and they are containing other monuments, monuments like that one we excavated here. Inside these mounds, Professor Klaus Schmidt and his team are excavating enormous carved stone pillars. Incredibly, they are the very first man-made monuments ever discovered. Professor Schmidt believes that in these enclosures, early man practiced a ritual ceremony to mark the passing of their dead. We have here a vulture, a very big vulture, with uh, his wings in such a position. There are more birds, there are snakes, there are other symbols, but there is a very big scorpion depicted here, and there are other animals, and here below there is a, clearly a human, and clearly there is no head on top of this body. And this complete image looks like an illustration of the nether world, not of our world here. And so maybe it's leading us to the function of these enclosures being uh, made for burial customs. The discoveries at Gobekli Tepe have completely revolutionized our understanding of early man. This kind of work is not a work done by everyone. 
It's a work of for specialists. The people who did it still had been hunter-gatherers. But they are meeting here, they are making festivals, feastings here, and now they have the, the manpower to produce the monolithic uh, pillars to, to transport them and to erect them here in this stone circle. The building of Gobekli Tepe, the organization of labor and resources, the skilled workmanship involved, and the collective commemoration of the dead are proof of a complex society 2,000 years before man stopped his wandering. In the Neolithic era, over 10,000 years ago, humans began to settle permanently and build houses and communities. The essence of the Neolithic is about domesticating environment and settling down in one place. The Neolithic is the beginnings of our journey to where we are today. Evidence of this vital change has been discovered in southern Turkey at Jatalhoyk. Over 9,000 years ago, Jatalhoyk looked like this. Houses with ovens and rooftop entrances. It's a story that's been pieced together by archaeology. So what we've got here are a series of mud brick houses. There's a house here and a house here. There's another one behind and one behind me here. The houses were built out of mud brick that was collected off site and they were generally sun dried. Here, you can see a line of bricks. They're very long bricks, but here you can also see the mortar. And what lay beneath the bricks offered another surprise. The people who lived here buried their dead in their own homes. When people died, uh, they were buried literally under their beds. So a hole would have been dug through this platform and the body placed inside. So literally, these people were living sometimes 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters above uh, their lost ones. In some houses, we've found one. Some houses have none. But then other houses have 15. The most we've found is something like 67 in one building. Bodies appeared as if ready for rebirth. and they were given precious items to take into their new life. We find a range of beads, stone, clay, shell, and bone beads. It is yet more evidence of emerging religious practice. And this developing society was able to take another revolutionary step. Here in Jatalhoik, we find the first evidence of farming. The river by Jatalhoik didn't only provide mud for building, the rich soils also proved very fertile and enabled the inhabitants to work the land. In the storage areas, we found pistachio nuts, amber nuts, we found um, peas, wheat. From there, we can learn about what they were growing out in their environment. The evidence is that the earliest crops and the domestication of animals began in southern Turkey over 10,000 years ago. Farming and the settled communities that worked the land expanded throughout Europe and by 7,000 years ago had arrived at its western edge. Agriculture produced a revolution in technology too. Archaeologists have discovered the telltale signs of its highly effective technology. So we find stone grinding tools that they may have crushed the, the, the wheat seeds up to make a kind of um, flour or crushed it up for a gruel. Something like this may have been um, a hunting tool. With agriculture and permanent settlement came more sophisticated technology first pottery for storing and transporting produce, then metal and metalworking for tools and utensils. 
farming was responsible for a revolution in society, too. It saw the careful organization of communal projects like irrigation and harvesting, and it needed rules for the division, maintenance, and inheritance of land. After the revolution of farming, the next great step on the road to civilization was an incredible invention, an invention that has shaped history and which is still crucial today, writing. One place where some of the earliest examples have been found is Mari, an ancient Sumerian city, sited on the banks of the Euphrates. It was well situated to profit from trade with Mesopotamia and beyond. Mari was built with a man-made canal running through its heart. To keep track of all the trade that passed through the city, Mari's inhabitants devised a special system. Scribes used a cut reed, pressing it into the surface of wet clay. The reed made a line with a wedge at the end, and these lines and cuts represent the very first examples of writing ever discovered. Over 25,000 inscribed tablets were found here using this text, invented around 5,000 years ago. It is perhaps in some ways the most momentous achievement which Homo sapiens has come up with, the, the, the idea that you can make a set of signs on a surface which other people would recognize and from that get the words of their language. It's a momentous and most wonderful invention, the results of which are still crucial to us today. The tablets were written in Akkadian, the shared common tongue across the Middle East at the time. The scholars who deciphered the text gave it a Latin name, calling it cuneiform, after the Latin cuneus, meaning wedge. The very earliest signs were what we call pictographs, where you have a linear, rather infantile sketch of a given thing, like a bird, which looks like a bird, and it means bird. But what happened in Mesopotamia and uniquely there is that the early people who were experimenting with writing had the idea in their minds that you could draw a symbol not for what it looked like but for what it sounded like. And once this uh, crucial step had taken place, uh, they very rapidly developed a whole range of signs which they could use to spell out the sound of their language. Translating this language enables us to bring back to life the Mari of thousands of years ago. To my lord, speak. About the wool ration of the courtiers, my lord wrote to me as follows. Provide wool for the wool ration of the courtiers. It's impossible to overestimate the impact of the invention of writing. It soon spread across the Middle East, quickly replacing pictograms and hieroglyphs. And then it spread beyond to much of the rest of the globe. By 2600 BC, writing had become a common feature of civilizations such as Mari, which with their trade, permanent settlements, farming techniques and administrations, were transforming into sophisticated societies. But with these developments came danger. Once civilizations bore these hallmarks of sophistication, they became objects of desire tempting gems coveted by others. One of the greatest treasures of Sumerian civilization, housed today in the British Museum, illustrates this conundrum perfectly. It's known as the Standard of Ur. This object from southern Iraq is just astonishingly beautiful. Um, it was made over 4,500 years ago, and although we don't know exactly what it was used for, there is no doubting how precious it was, because if you just look at the materials that are used, um, there's lapis lazuli stone here, and red limestone, and precious shells. Uh, it clearly tells us a story, and what I think this is, is this is a society that is working Everything is very ordered. Uh, you have the men laboring in the fields at the bottom, then you have a procession of fat animals being brought in, probably for some kind of religious sacrifice. Uh, there are goats and handfuls of fish and even 
some cattle. And then up at the top here is the court. Um, there are men sitting, toasting the king. And clearly, he is in control of the people beneath him. Um, it's actually a very uh, peaceful and cultured scene. But if you go around the other side of this, you find that uh, reality is a little different because here we have a terrible scene of war. Here at the bottom, you have men who are being trampled by charging horses as they pull their chariots. Uh, you have naked men being brought in, groveling to the king who is standing with his staff. So it's a cogent and visceral reminder that when you create a great civilization, this is a jewel that attracts thieves, and there are always going to be others who want what you've got. One civilization that experienced terrible war on a gigantic scale was the fabled city of Troy, established by Greeks trading in Anatolia at the end of the second millennium. While scholars still debate the exact causes of the war, the city has been mythologized as a place where East met West in brutal conflict. The Greek poet Homer immortalized Troy in the epic story, The Iliad. Although we may think of the stories of the Trojan Wars as just a legend or a myth, archaeologists have found Troy. This is one of the most ancient um, entrances into the city. And we know that the Greeks really thought that the Trojan War did happen here. Homer's tale of the Trojan War reflects the real moment in history when the ancient Greeks began to expand to the older, more established civilizations of the East. Through expeditions, trade, and war, in the next centuries, the city-states of ancient Greece grew in power and cultural influence. When you look at the history of the relationship between East and West, it, it could seem just like a catalogue of retribution and counter-retribution. But actually, the whole time these civilizations were learning from one another and their fates were inextricably linked. War allowed not only for territorial expansion, but for immense cultural exchange. As the Greeks moved east, they discovered civilizations that had long influenced their own. The celebrated King Alexander the Great of the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon would discover this firsthand when he conquered large parts of the Middle East. When Alexander reached the ancient city of Babylon in the fourth century BC, he discovered the indelible mark that had been left by the East on Western ideas. At Babylon, Alexander found an incredibly advanced society, highly knowledgeable in math and science, demonstrating a level of sophistication unparalleled in the West. Babylon lies 53 miles south of Baghdad in Iraq. Some reconstruction of the ancient city began in 1983. The city had an illustrious history. The capital of the Babylonian Empire and the largest city on earth with a population of nearly 200,000 people. It was surrounded by a high wall with beautiful glazed blue tiles. Babylon was a place of great wealth, architectural splendor, and innovative scientific inquiry. Babylonian astronomers kept precise lists of eclipses, equinoxes, and solstices from 747 BC. They were driven by a compulsion to understand portents and omens and assuage their gods. So all of these get recorded systematically, night after night, month after month, year after year, for over 600 years. By Alexander's time, all the omens had been collected together into an enormous series of observations and predictions. And this tablet, which is the 21st chapter of the 70-chapter series, is all about solar eclipses. 
And it was gradually through very long periods of observing the skies that scholars noticed that these events were not random at all and were not just the whims of the gods, but were very sophisticated mathematical patterns, often very complex and often very long in duration. Alexander's arrival in Babylon accelerated the process of Greek absorption of ancient Eastern learning. He translated much of the Babylonian observations and sent them back to Greece. So from the fourth century onwards, we can point to many, many very specific examples where we can be absolutely confident that individual Greek scholars had access to the writings of individual nameable Babylonian scholars, and that's really very exciting. Every time we look at our watches, we're doing something Babylonian. Every time we read the horoscopes in the newspapers, we're doing something Babylonian. Every time we measure an angle, we're doing something Babylonian. There are some very fundamental everyday practices that we all do, which are, we owe to ancient Middle Eastern civilizations that we really just don't think about. The Babylonians were brilliant mathematicians. They were the first to use angles, degrees, fractions, and equations. They didn't count in our decimal system using 10 as a base, but used 60 instead, a method known as the sexagesimal system. 60 is a more versatile number than 10 to base a numeric system on, as it is divisible by two and five, but also by three. It's more flexible for complex astronomical calculations. The 60 base system gave the Babylonians 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 360 days in a year, and 360 degrees in a circle. Following the lead of Babylon thousands of years before, at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, London, founded in 1675, astronomers divided the world into 360 degrees. Furthermore, the first astronomer royal at Greenwich, John Flamsteed, mapped the skies and catalogued the stars just as the Babylonians had done. We can see this book, which is his Historia Celestis. This is his life's work, essentially, from all the observations that he did. Flamsteed inherited um, a traditional observation that goes back through his predecessors, through the Renaissance, through um, Arabic scholars, back through the Romans, the Greeks, ultimately going back to the Babylonians as well. The Babylonian numerical system also created the 12 signs of the zodiac. They subdivided those 360 degrees into 12 um, sections of 30 degrees. And this chart here shows it very clearly. Here we can see the triangles um, into those 30 degree segments. And each of the 30 degree segments is associated with a particular constellation that appears near its middle. And so we have Scorpio, Libra, Virgo, Leo, cancer and so on around here. Extraordinarily, the symbols and names we still use for the stars go all the way back to the Babylonian astronomers of over 2,000 years ago. We have the, uh, the names of the zodiacal signs written on hundreds and if not thousands of tablets, but this little one here um, is particularly interesting to us. Each line has a different zodiacal sign all the way down here. Um, so this is the eighth, this is Scorpio, written along here, there's Scorpion. Um, uh, and then on the other side, here are the last four, and then a line underneath to show that that's the end of the series, that there are no more than 12. So all the names of the zodiac are originally Babylonian. Taurus, the bull, is called the bull of heaven in Babylonian. Leo is the lion. The Babylonian zodiac was one of mankind's first attempts to find order and meaning in our apparently incomprehensible world. And we still have that sense now that everyone knows their star sign and we pretend we don't believe it, but we all read our horoscopes sneakily anyway. And so the very idea that our fate is determined by the skies is something that has very, very um, deep roots in Babylonian thought. The scientific and mathematical learning that arose in Babylon and flowed west transformed civilization forever. But as excavations at Miletus have shown, it was not the only Eastern idea traveling in this direction. Extraordinary new discoveries here have shown how Eastern religious beliefs were moving westward, 
leaving footprints as they went. Miletus was in the Persian Empire, but it was populated by Greeks who had lived on the coast of Asia Minor for centuries. The people of Miletus worshipped an array of gods common to the Greek world, such as Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Aphrodite was one of the greatest Greek goddesses. In her sanctuary here, archaeologists have discovered beautiful figurines given as offerings to the goddess. From these, they have pieced together evidence showing the remarkable degree to which the Greeks in Miletus absorbed Eastern ideas, even in their gods. This is a very early piece showing how Aphrodite as a mighty goddess of vegetation. And this is another one showing her as the mistress of animals. These are all old Near Eastern symbols. The Aphrodite figurines discovered in Miletus are nearly all Eastern rather than Greek in style. It seems clear that the Miletians' idea of Aphrodite came from the East. Like Aphrodite, other ancient god forms also traveled from the East to the West, as did the concept of polytheism, or belief in multiple deities. Evidence of this still stands in the heart of Greece today. The Parthenon, the temple to Athena on the Acropolis in Athens, survives as a fabulous reminder of the enduring power of the ancient gods. Many of the statues and friezes that once adorned the Parthenon are now in the British Museum in London. The Greeks thought that the gods were like humans, but just a bit bigger, a bit brighter, um, a bit shinier. Here you have Dionysus and Selene, the god of the moon, and Aphrodite, the god of sexual love. You have to realize that the ancient Greeks, gods and demigods and spirits were everywhere in the world. This was how they explained what was going on around them. So when they saw the tides rise and fall, when they saw the grain ripening in the fields, they knew, they didn't think, they knew that this was the power of a god or gods who would make this all happen for them. The Romans adopted the Greek pantheon of gods adapting their names. Zeus became Jupiter. Dionysus became Bacchus. Aphrodite became Venus. The Greeks and Romans had hundreds of gods, one for every eventuality. In some ways, this meant it was very exhausting being a Greek because you had to rush around keeping all these various gods on side. But it also meant you always had a chance of success. So if Apollo hadn't heard your prayer, then maybe Aphrodite would. The many gods of the ancient world coexisted peacefully for millennia until an idea began to evolve that would challenge the concept of polytheism forever. To understand how this happened, we need to travel back to the land of Canaan and the ancient site of Tel Hazor. It is the largest site in the country. It's more than 200 acres with a population of some 15 to 20,000 people, which makes it comparable to Paris, London, New York of today. It's a major site. There is clear evidence here of the many gods of Canaan. We are in a place of worship of the Canaanite period. You can see, first of all, by the standing stones, which were worshiped. And we have the names of the different gods. The god Sin was worshiped. The moon god was worshiped. The god El was worshiped. The Canaanites worshiped a pantheon of gods, headed by El his wife, Asherah, and Baal. And when the Israelites emerged in Canaan over 3,000 years ago, they appeared to have worshipped the same Canaanite gods. The chief god of the Canaanites is called El. So is called the chief god of the Israelites. He's called El, or Elohim. There is no question that a lot of cult practices and ideas were taken over. 
The Bible confirms that the Israelites worshiped these Canaanite gods. And so in the early books of the Bible, we see a struggle for the hearts and minds of the Israelites, a battle between the old pagan Canaanite gods and the one God who revealed himself as Yahweh. Anochi Adonai Elohecha asher ocitiha meeretz Mitzrayim mibet avadim lo yiye lecha Elohim achayim I am Yahweh, your God. You shall have no other gods before me. It's the first of the Ten Commandments given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. And so this is what we have in the time of Moses. A commandment of worshiping the one without negating the existence of the others. The Israelites had Yahweh as their God, but they didn't yet conceive of him as the only God. Despite the commandments and the warnings of Moses and other prophets, the Israelites still persisted with the worship of other gods, including females. This little clay figurine was found in my excavations in a site, a large site in northern Israel, south of the Lake of Galilee, called Tel Rechov. The figurine is nearly 3,000 years old. It's an example of thousands of female figurines discovered throughout the region in the Israelite period. She's holding here a young, a baby. She's holding a baby. So she's a mother. She's a mother goddess. Experts believe this is the figure of Asherah. The Israelites were still worshiping this Canaanite goddess. They imagined her as the wife of their god, Yahweh. We have, for example, inscriptions on jars which say to Yahweh and his Asherah. Okay, so there is Yahweh and there is, if you want to say, Mrs. Yahweh, Asherah. It took several centuries before the Israelites finally embraced Yahweh as the one and only God. And to make that happen needed a catastrophe. 2,600 years ago, Jerusalem is attacked by the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. The city is ransacked. The house of Yahweh, the temple, is destroyed. And thousands of Jews are taken as slaves into exile. Yahweh seemed defeated. It was an, an, a theological catastrophe because the simple fact was that the God of Israel was defeated by the God of the Babylonians. This was the way people looked at it at that time. And they had to explain what had happened. This was, they had either to yield and forget all about this and be part of the Babylonian uh, um, culture, or they had to come up with this, uh, with an explanation. In captivity in Babylon, the Israelites developed a revolutionary explanation for the defeat of their god, Yahweh. They came up with an amazing, you know, way of uh, philosophic already, you know, explanation of what exactly had happened and how it came about that the god of Israel was supposedly defeated, but in fact he won, you know. They say, well, let's think about this. The god of Israel is so powerful that he is universal that he rules everything, that he decides everything, that he sent the king of Babylonia. The king of Babylonia was no more than a little pion in the hands of the God of Israel to be sent to punish the apostasy of the Israelites. No more than that. The winning God wasn't the Babylonian God. He was Yahweh using the Babylonians to punish the Israelites. So Yahweh is not just the Israelites' God. He's the Babylonians' God. He's everyone's God. An unknown prophet given the name Isaiah created the first defining statement of monotheism and changed the course of human history. There is no other God besides me. I am the creator of good and evil. I am the creator of 
light and darkness. There is no one beside me. It's absolutely a watershed moment in history. There's a sense in terms of religion that it's maybe the greatest idea. But the Jews did not spread their brilliant new idea to the rest of the world. That was the work of another religion built on the foundations of Judaism and arising in the Middle East, Christianity. Because Christianity arose from the teachings of Judaism, the two religions share many beliefs. Both look to the figure of Abraham as a founding father of their faith. The story of Abraham first appears in Genesis, the first book of the Jewish Bible. When you open the Bible, you very quickly come to Abraham. And basically the whole Bible from then on is the story of one man's family. Everything is about his encounter with God, his experience with God. And I will make of thee a great nation. The defining moment in Abraham's story why he is synonymous with monotheism, came with a command from God. Take your only son, your beloved son, and go to the land of Moriah, and there you will sacrifice him to me. But on the crucial moment, there is a voice from heaven. Don't touch the child. I don't want him to be sacrificed. You have proved yourself to be loyal to God. While Judaism and Christianity agree on the importance of Abraham, some details of the story differ. In the Jewish tradition, Abraham's intended sacrifice was in Jerusalem. Jews erected a temple here to commemorate the spot. It was said to be one of the greatest buildings in antiquity. The temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, rebuilt, then destroyed again by the Romans. The surviving Western Wall is one of the holiest places in Judaism. It's impossible to be precise about Abraham. Biblical chronology suggests he lived nearly 4,000 years ago but there's no hard proof of his existence. There's no archeological evidence of Abraham. He didn't leave a monument somewhere in the desert saying Abraham was here. There is a growing distance between what people think about history of this region according to the biblical text and what archeology span shows. So it is extremely difficult and tricky to reconstruct even the germs of history from these uh, myths. In addition to following the Abrahamic tradition, Christianity worshiped Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. The Church of the Nativity marks the spot where it's believed he was born. At the Jewish festival of Passover, Jesus came to preach in Jerusalem. Seen as a threat to the Roman peace, he was arrested, tried, and sentenced to death. Today, pilgrims still walk the route Jesus is supposed to have taken to his crucifixion. The route ends at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the traditional site of his crucifixion and burial. 2,000 years later, Christianity, a religion born in the Middle East, has two billion followers. But how did the Christian version of monotheism finally overcome polytheism to be the largest religion in the world? Jesus Christ himself didn't invent a world religion. 
he lived a life and he was an exemplar of his faith. It was others who came after him who developed his ideas, the personal relationship that he was said to have had with his father, God, into a belief system, into a world faith. Jesus didn't spread Christianity and monotheism. That was the work of another man, Saul of Tarsus. Blinded by a vision of Jesus, then miraculously healed, Saul took up the faith and changed his name to Paul. Paul believed that Jesus' message of spiritual renewal could be preached not just to Jews, but to Gentiles, who had long been considered religious outcasts. If they accepted Jesus into their lives, they could be baptized and become children of God, too. What Paul says is, you know, if Gentiles, non-Jews, have faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they believe in the Messiah, Jesus, aren't they really children of Abraham in a spiritual sense? Paul's missionary journeys took him from Syria to Cyprus and Asia Minor to Greece. So what he starts doing is missionizing, traveling, first of all through Asia Minor or Turkey, and he goes to little towns and villages and people come to hear him give lectures. Paul traveled to one of the greatest cities on earth. Ephesus was the capital of Roman Asia, now lying in modern day Turkey. At the time, it was the second largest city in the world. Nearly half a million people lived here. It was full of buildings celebrating the many gods of the Greco-Roman world, including the massive temple of Artemis. If Paul could convert the Greek and Roman pagans of Ephesus to Christianity, then the new religion could spread through the empire. If you think about the achievement of Paul and what he did in bringing Christianity to the world, it's just staggering to think about because when Paul lands in every city are dozens and dozens of temples, beautiful buildings, edifices to all of these gods and goddesses of Greece and Rome and Egypt, that's not gonna go away very easily. Here in Ephesus, Paul and his fellow missionaries wrote and preached the new gospels of Christianity, a religion distinct from its roots in Judaism that would eventually take the idea of monotheism beyond its Middle Eastern home. Paul took the Christian message from the Middle East to Rome, the capital of the empire and the heart of paganism. Here, Christians worshiped in secret. Soon, Paul incurred the wrath of the pagan authorities. Paul is believed to have been executed in Rome in the reign of the Emperor Nero. Christianity continued to be a persecuted religion in the Roman Empire. Christians were regularly martyred for their refusal to accept the Roman gods. It would take another 250 years and one final battle for monotheism, or the belief in one god, to triumph. On this bridge where I'm standing, the Milvian Bridge, this great battle took place. Now, there's a sense in which you could say monotheism hung in the balance on this bridge. In the year 312, two armies met here outside Rome at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. On one side, the army of Constantine, the emperor of Rome's eastern provinces. Opposing him, Maxentius, a usurper. Maxentius's army was driven into the Tiber, where Maxentius drowned. In the great forum of Rome, Constantine erected a triumphal arch as a symbol of his victory. 
The following year, the new emperor proclaimed religious toleration in the Roman Empire. 70 years later, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman world. It's the triumph of an idea, the belief in one God, an idea that came from the Middle East and now dominates the West. It's also an idea that has been taken on by other religions. In the following centuries, a new monotheist religion, Islam, embodied and adapted the faith of Abraham, spreading at rapid speed across the Middle East and beyond. It is a continuation of the Middle East's extraordinary influence on Western beliefs, learning, and culture.